Hello, welcome back. Uh, we're now in marketing management um, module number three. Today we're going to look at collecting information and forecasting demand. Now, as you can imagine, this is an important thing. So what are we going to be looking at? What are the components of a modern marketing information system? In other words, where do we get our information from in the first place? What are useful internal records for this kind of system? What makes up a marketing intelligence system and influ influential macroeconomic developments? And how can companies actually measure forecast demand? So let's start with that. What we're first looking at, obviously, as you can imagine, anything uh, we need to do before we start actually our marketing uh, programs and planning and campaigns we need to get a vast amount of information we need to know what is actually going on in the world we've already looked at things like SWOT analysis so strengths weaknesses which are internal to us and then opportunities and threats which obviously are the external factors so the things that are obviously going to be very influential uh, for us before we even start any kind of campaign is getting information from those who matter. First and foremost, the customers. So we need as much information as possible about the customers. We'll go into detail exactly what. And then obviously the external factors, those things that will, are going to affect us that are outside of our control and outside of the company. And obviously one of those additionally is also the competitors. Remember, the competitors are always watching us and we have to be watching them to know what each are doing so that we have to be aware and maybe make changes in the market. A market information system really is uh, the use of various components. Obviously, we have people, procedures, equipment, computer systems, uh, software with the uh, idea to gather, sort, analyze, evaluate, and then distribute that information that is needed to all those that it's relevant to, which can be throughout the entire organization. And it has to be delivered as soon as possible in a timely method, and it has to be as precise as possible. Now, some of the components where we get marketing information from obviously we'll have our own internal records which if you consider the kind of records that we have these will obviously be things based on history historical um, events such as uh, how much we've sold in a particular area how uh, the kind of people that we've sold to so any information that we specifically record about our clients and about our sales systems that we've been operating since our inception of the company and obviously we have to do market research obviously this if we're going especially if we're going into new markets we're going to have to look at what is the population what is the breakdown of the population the demographics etc lots of things that we're going to have to look at and general insight our feeling as to as towards things like trends that are happening we also starting with the the internal uh, record systems well, one of the main things is the order to payment cycle. Well, this entails the process that orders go through once they are received by the company. So that will include things like invoices, shipping documents. Now, customers prefer firms that can get orders processed quickly and as and precisely or accurately as possible. And then we also have our sales information system. This those that we mentioned based on the sales that we've had in the past. How many, where, what was the people, who were the people that were buying them, how did they pay for them? Now, hopefully, depending on the kind of company we have, we're going to have a lot of information of our own, but we still have to go to databases. So a database stores and organizes the information that can be retrieved based on a number of criteria, such as purchasing history, product preferences for customers, and may even contain demographic and psychographic information on customers, if we are in a company that is able to store that kind of information. Marketing intelligence. A marketing intelligence system uh, is a set of procedures and sources that managers use to obtain everyday information about developments in the marketing environment. In other words, what is generally going on in the world that is affecting them for their purposes? Now, obviously, things like news and trade publications are very important. So we can see not only what is going on in our uh, particular company, but also what's going on in the market that we're involved in as a whole in our industry. And this may include things that uh, information that we get from uh, trade events as well, which is why they're so popular. 
Now, obviously, managers need to meet without the customers, the suppliers, the distributors and other managers. They have an input as well and will give us vast amounts of information on what the customers are thinking, where they're going. And this gives us much more intelligence as to what's going on in the outside world that will affect our marketing efforts. And obviously, uh, monitor social media sites. This is a method where we can, especially with something like LinkedIn, where we can uh, come across people in similar kind of positions as ours in other companies and get to insight and information of what's going on in other companies as well. So all of these add up to a vast amount of information that we constantly need to review to make our decisions much better. So to improve this, well, the first thing that we have to look at uh, through these methods that we have here, like the sales force. Remember the sales force are the people that are actually getting in touch with the customers. They're the ones that face the customers on a day-to-day -day basis. So they are getting information about the products of how the customers feel. So we need to have that information. We can also establish a network of people involved in a similar industry. So we know what is going on generally in the industry. And maybe we'll use outside experts, uh, people probably like myself, uh, consultants who've worked in similar companies and in other environments and have a, a good insight and information about the market as a whole. And maybe we can even form a customer, customer advisory panel where we get specific uh, customers that have been loyal to us that we can employ and get information out of them on a regular basis as to why they buy our particular products, what it is they prefer, what it is that they could enhance in our um, products that we're selling. Now, companies can improve the marketing intelligence through these methods that we've mentioned as well as through channel members, government data sources, purchase of information through secondary data sources that already exist and has been done by somebody else. So a marketing intelligence system, obviously now with the internet, has been expanded. So this now can also include in, uh, uh, additional sources such as independent online forums where people are talking about our kinds of products, services, companies, maybe even our company specifically. Distributor or sales agent feedback sites, so there are sites that they would use to give feedback. Customer review and expert opinion sites and also customer complaint sites. So some examples of that, uh, eopinions.com, bizrate.com or consumerreview.com are some particular examples of those. And because these are done by uh, independent outside people from us, it, we generally consider that the views expressed on these sites um, is much more correct or, or uh, less biased, let's say. Now, obviously, once we have this information, well, it should be gathered and shared as quickly as possible with those decision makers, those people within our company that make the decisions as to where we're going to sell, how we're going to sell. Maybe it could be that if this uh, information comes in, that there's a, uh, a method of improving our service, that the people that develop the service should be told so they can improve it and therefore provide a better service to the customers. Now, those are the things that obviously that we, we need to be aware of working within our company. But if we look at the macro environment, now the macro environment refers to those elements closest to the companies, customer, competition, suppliers. But we've looked at those. The macro environment refers to elements that can impact a company, but cannot be controlled. In other words, cannot be controlled by us as the company. So these things include things like the economy, the economy generally of what's going on, culture, demographics, politics, technology, and the natural environment. So we'll be looking at each one of those individual aspects to see how they may affect our marketing efforts. We also have to be aware of things like needs and uh, trends and particular things, that, uh, as we can see here, that you may remember some of these, a fad, usually considered short term trend and mega trends. So to explain those, a fad usually very short lived and very unpredictable and usually without social, economic or political significance. So fads are usually me measured in months rather than in years. So wham, uh, zero sold 25 million hula hoops in the first four months. But <laughs> after that, no, pet rocks were launched in the mid 70s and sold a million units in a matter of months. But months later, sales were non-existent. Trends, on the other hand, offer a view of the future to, due to their momentum and, dis and durability. The fitness and diet trend is an example. 
Although there have been many fads within the trend, the overall movement is, uh, towards healthier living has remained. Now, we tend to consider one of the differences uh, of a way of identifying, say, a trend rather than a fad, is it's generally considered a trend will usually go over, overlap into different markets. So if the, the hula hoop is, is restricted to one particular market, the, the toy market, Whereas trends, if we're talking of something like fitness, well, it will be gyms, it can be food, it can be uh, sports clothing. It goes into various different industries and therefore is most likely to be much longer lasting. Mega trends, those are slow to form, but once established can last for much longer, 10 to, uh, seven to 10 years or more. So mega trends influence all factors of life that impact businesses, culture, economic, society, and personal lives. We had the example here of uh, electric cars, and that is becoming a, a new mega trend. We did mention the major environmental forces, so we'll look at some of those: demographics, uh, technological, economic, political, social, cultural, and natural. We'll look at each one. If you consider the demographic environment, obviously the market that we're in, we're, ba we're talking of dealing with people, but this keeps changing. Uh, as we can see, 6.8 billion people in 2010. I think currently we're at 7.5 billion, estimated to grow to 9 billion in 2020. Also, population, the age mix. Mexico is a very young population. Italy, on the other hand, is an old population. So in, by 2011, it was said that those under 65 will grow faster than the entire US population. Why? Because they're getting older at that with a larger amount of people. And this is going to impact on us when we know that if a particular country's uh, average age is much older, well, we have to change maybe our marketing methods or even the products that we're selling them to reflect that market that is there. Uh, ethnic and other markets, so 25 million people in the US were born in another country. Hispanics accounted for 11% of the US population in 2000, but by 2020 it will be nearly double that at 18.9%. Education groups, well obviously the groups of those, uh, education is generally, the uh, groups are getting more and more educated. Household patterns, well 20% of households are now conventional, married with children, 27 single live alones, single parent families amount to 8% and living with non-relatives only 5% and other family structures 8%. If we were to consider, uh, I've got here that the world uh, has now reached 7.5 billion people. So there was some research was conducted, uh, so I've updated these, these numbers, um, and these are for 2016. So the changes of the past 10 years is quite remarkable. In 2006, only one person out of 100 would have had a college education. Now, we mentioned earlier about the demographics of how this, these things have changed. Now that number is seven out of 100 with a college education. So working these out as percentages, if the world were 100 people, well, it's nicely divided between male and female equally. 25 of those would be children, and obviously 75 adults, but nine of them would be over 65 years old. But there would be 60 Asians, 16 Africans, 14 people from the Americans, and only 10 Europeans. In other words, 10% of the population of the world are European. 31% would be Christian, 23% Muslims, etc. And then the languages they would speak. Clearly, uh, we, we have here 12 would speak Chinese, 6 Spanish, and 5 speaking English. Although, obviously, in, it's worth mentioning, I suppose, here that English, although it's officially down here, is the third language, uh, which it is, it's the third native language, uh, it's still one of the most spoken languages on the planet, either as a first or second language, whereas Chinese, um, well, it's debatable because there's so many different versions of that. But 85% would be able to read and write and 14 would not. 40% uh, have an internet connection. Right, the economic environment. Obviously, this is, this is a major factor when we're dealing with uh, any kind of a product that we're selling or, or services as well, obviously. But depending on the purchasing power, the actual how much people are earning, the amount of money that they're earning, there's certain things that is going to affect the, the amount that they have available to spend. Obviously, their actual income that they're earning, but obviously the prices, as prices increase, people have less uh, amount of things that they can buy. 
and obviously how much savings they had. Maybe the ability to get credit, if credit is easy to get, generally speaking, in certainly in, in many Western countries, it's, um, very, it's more preferential to buy things on credit. If we have large amounts of debt, maybe we shan't be buying much more. And again, the consumer psychology, in other words, it's considered in certain uh, countries, especially in the United States, uh, where it's more materialistic, that the psychology is to show off, to, to show how much, we've, uh, how much we're making and spend that money and buy things like big flashy cars and jewelry and uh, branded clothes. And obviously the income distribution. Now this can actually be hugely important when we're considering going into other markets, especially in other countries, of how the income is distributed. If it's a very small amount of, of the population has the wealth and a very large uh, percentage of the population is poor, that may decide, uh, make the make, uh, help us make the decision of not going into a particular market, even though the population itself of the country is very large. And obviously, if we look back at the financial crisis in 2008 and 9, which took many years to get out, uh, out of that situation, well, it's permanently changed many consumers and their buying habits. Um, people are much less uh, propensed to maybe uh, spending too much on property, especially with the property bubble that happened. So these things also have an effect on the consumer's buying habits, which we are going to have to know about before we can uh, understand them and market them. Uh, if we look at uh, the socio-cultural, so it's those things um, that have uh, are affected uh, our uh, belief system and what we feel is important to us and how we interact with others. So that is our environment. Now, there's certain things that we would, um, it, it's basically our view of the outside world and everything else. So how in each of our, our cultures do we view ourselves? Do we view ourselves as independent go-getting people or do we view ourselves as part of something larger? How do we view others? How do we view people either of our same uh, cultural background or of a different background? How do we view the, the universe in, in general? How do we view society and organizations? And what is our relationship with nature? Is it one where we seek to preserve it or where we don't have much concern for it? The natural environment. Well, companies must be cognizant of the effect of their business on the environment and also how regulations can influence its competitive position. Changes in regulations decided by governments or other organizations can provide opportunities for companies, but sometimes may only be recognized if the company includes that aspect into their strategic planning. But obviously it can also restrict them. I've ha actually had personal uh, experience of this where uh, regulations has changed and actually have prevented me from continuing in a particular business that I was involved in. Technology. How is that going to change? Well, obviously this changes a lot of things. The, the actual rate of change at the moment is accelerating much faster. If you consider how, how often people would change their, their TVs or their cell phones or their telephones in general over the past 20 years, it's becoming much faster. The rate of change is becoming more. The new products are coming out. Uh, it's advancing all the time. And this is reflecting on customers' requirements. They now feel that they need the latest technology. If you have a cell phone that's two or three years old, you're grossly out of date. Now, this can also provide unlimited opportunities. As soon as a new uh, product or service can come out or a, uh, a new system is available, immediately there, there are offshoots and opportunities that are available from that. Uh, if you consider certainly in the software industry, when, when a new um, system or platform comes out, immediately there are masses of apps of how to take advantage of that and improve it. And obviously, research and development now spending is still increasing. Now, the political legal environment, well, again, this is something else where, where laws change and we have to be aware of this. We have to be aware of uh, whatever it is we're doing and how we're impacting uh, the public with our products and services. There may be legal requirements. Now, the laws themselves that exist will change over time. There are also government agencies that are involved, um, environmental protection agencies, etc., police agencies, of course, and special interest groups. Now, these can provide opportunities. 
but they could also provide threats to the, the, our business and the nature of the business of what's going on. If you consider, for example, with Uber, uh, because of the, the local government agencies, particularly local governments, um, had to step in to either restrict them operating uh, because of the um, problems that were causing with the taxi industry. So we're now going to look at forecasting and demand measurement. So when we're looking at the market, we have various things. Obviously, the size of the market, the actual amount that we can be selling to, the growth potential of that market, and obviously the potential for profit from those. As you can see, there are different market types. So the penetrated market is that that we have actually penetrated. So that is the ones that we actually have. But if we look at the potential market as a whole, this is in many cases, people say that the potential market is pretty much everybody on the planet, but it isn't. Obviously, it is that that you can actually reach. So first of the potential market of a, of a certain amount that would be interested potentially in your product or service. Then the available market, in other words, those that can actually get at your products that you can service, they are available. Others that are in the potential market, not in the available market, maybe just too far away to be able to access. The target market, again, is those that you are limiting your um, marketing efforts towards, that you can approach, you can find them. So that is going to be smaller because you're not going to be able to talk to absolutely everybody in the available market. And the penetrated market is those that you've actually managed to convince to become customers. We have obviously different kinds of, of demand measurements, obviously with it between uh, short, medium and long term. So just in, in terms of how long we want to deal with people, the demand, whether it be over um, uh, a monthly basis or weekly basis or in a yearly basis or the demand over a longer period. And then obviously we have the restrictions of by, by space. So are we talking of a worldwide demand or a national demand, a region, territorial demand? And then the products that we have, literally all sales included or just for a particular industry, a particular company, a particular product line, product form or a product term. So each one of those demands can be restricted and then put into a category so that we can analyze what is the requirement of a particular uh, 1.6 litre uh, Ford Mondeo in the next six months in uh, the state of Ohio for example, which would just be one particular box out of a box three uh, by six by five, making 90. So the market demand. Market demand is the total volume that would be bought by a defined customer group in a particular area, in a particular time, in a defined market environment, under a defined marketing program. So the demand, in other words, what we're expecting to get is that particular share that we have estimated that we're going to get for our particular marketing efforts in a particular region. And that is our company demand. But of course, market demand is not fixed, so it can change based on a number of variables. If a firm in an industry increases market expenditure, in extra publicity or whatever, or reduces prices, or raises them, then obviously demand can increase or fail, or fall, sorry. The financial environment also influences overall market demand. In other words, in times of recession, generally speaking, the demand is less. In times of prosperity, the market potential is higher. If we were to look at uh, specific uh, demands, generally speaking, we'll look at the amount of buyers that we have out there. This is the total market potential, the amount of buyers that exist the average amount that they would buy and times the average price. That will give us a, a dollar or euro or pound amount. And then that, that is the total. And obviously we can subdivide that into particular areas. This helps us divide our marketing budget so that we can understand if certain areas, be it that they are be geographically smaller, but have a much a greater level of potential for the market, it may be m much better idea to spend more money in a specific area. Uh, if we were to look at certain products that are maybe in the UK market, maybe much better than say the Greek market, just by the fact that it's a much smaller country, but by because it's got a, a much denser and higher population. So the total market potential is the maximum sales to all firms in an industry during a given period 
under a given level of industry marketing efforts and environmental conditions. Area market is the sales potential, obviously, for a specific territory within that. Now, looking at the, the sale, uh, the chain ratio method, it's to work out if we have here, as an example, a demand for a new light beer. So we're trying to work this out. So if we have a demand for the new light beer times the population, in other words, what percentage would like that kind of beer times the population times the amount of income that they would spend first off on food or beverages and specifically alcohol free beverages. Then that would give us an expected percentage of how much would be spent on the light beer. Problem now comes in. That is based on the past. It's based on specific figures. How do we estimate the future demand? So let's have um, just go over what we've we've been through. If you think that the whole thing that we're looking at on this is estimating how much demand there's going to be in the future for our products or services. Now, obviously, a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at has been either based on past history and another part is pretty much based on guesswork. So what we have to try and do is get as much information as possible. But the problem is there's a lot of information out there. So we have to understand the different sources that we have and the viability of each one of those sources. Now, obviously, one of the main things that is important is when we're talking about dealing with our sales force, as we said, they are the ones that see our customers on a daily basis. Now, this could be people in the shop floor of your store, literally the person behind the counter. They see people coming into their stores on a regular basis and they tell them what kind of things they want. Do you have this? No. And they would be perhaps the only ones that are actually aware of that. In other words, people sitting back in the, in the head office would not be aware of, say, the lack of sales that are getting because people are coming in asking for something that they don't have. Uh, do, do you have a particular product in blue when they don't? The, the head office would never know that there is a demand for that particular product in blue, whereas those that are talking to the customers on a regular basis would be aware of that and would be in a position to say we have 35, 40 inquiries a day on average for this particular product in blue or with a larger screen or with, with a particular benefit or uh, attribute to the product. They would know that. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they are closer to the people that are buyer, that are buying. So they obviously understand the buyer's intentions. They see what the buyers will looking to buy in the future and now. But again, even if those were satisfied, it's still only a guess because obviously what people are buying today is no indication of what they buy for the future. So although we're looking at forecasting, and it's not uh, by uh, mistake that somebody we have here, somebody looking in a crystal ball, it's specifically that it is still guesswork, but we're basing it on our best guess based on the information. So using intelligence of what is going on, seeing where trends are going. Now, clearly, as you would probably be aware in, in certain um, we, we have the, the bell curve, the famous bell curve for uh, the product life cycle. But it, the problem is, is analyzing exactly where we are on that particular life cycle. Are we still increasing demand or is it starting to plateau out? So obviously we're going to have to understand what we've done so far. Analyze these things very carefully, certainly on past sales, using past sales, showing us maybe that the increasing sales is reducing or overall sales are reducing. Therefore, we can probably guess pretty accurately where we are on this particular curve and therefore understand that in a short term future that maybe sales will start to drop off or the opposite, whereby in the demand itself is increasing over a period based on our analysis of things that have happened in the past, like past sales, and therefore it's likely to be uh, an ongoing increase. And then obviously we still need expert opinion, not necessarily by the bespectacled grey haired old person, but by the intelligence and investigation that we are doing based on people who've done studies, people that are in the markets, people that have worked with these companies over a period, they can sense the market. They have spoken maybe to a far greater amount of people. They have a better network and they are in a position to give us more information on the future as a potential. 
and this will guide us uh, and give us a more precise, more accurate kind of um, information that we can base our figures on to sustain a particular demand that is still estimated. So, to end the presentation, we have to take all the information that is available. We have to analyze it all very carefully. We still have to come up with our best guess based on the information that we have. Now, there's lots of things we have to do and study to make our numbers more precise, but we can never be totally precise. And besides, things happen out there. Things change and something terrible could happen and it would change everything. However, we base the future demand on the information that we have and the information that we are getting based on our intelligence system. So that's it for this particular uh, chapter and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.